Um, we're gonna we're gonna get going this evening. Um, uh, it, I think I get, everybody has a has a handout, so um, we're we're gonna be looking tonight at the the parable of the rich man and Lazarus out of out of Luke chapter sixteen. And for those that might, you know, I know I've been asked a couple of times. I didn't I didn't finish last week. I actually did finish last week in the sense of I addressed the parable and what I did if you recall is, is I added some extra verses that kind of helped made the parable a, a little bit more understandable right if you remember the parable of <clears throat> of the of the um, unjust judge right he was you know the, the, the purpose of that parable that, that we learned right from the get-go was that, Hey, you just need to remain consistent. And so we talked about that remaining consistent. And then what I did was I included some verses after that that talked about Jesus making sure that, that we knew, hey, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, because that, that sort of applied to that, that consistency that we ought to keep, you know, going to Jesus in prayer and, and going to Jesus with our needs and our concerns and, and our prayer requests and things like that. And so that's why I didn't cover the last few verses in the handout last week, because it was kind of, you know, it, it was kind of repetitive. I just preached on that the previous Sunday, and it just didn't make sense to kind of just, you know, keep knocking on that door, maybe beating that dead horse, whatever side you want to. Sorry, pup, pup. That was just me knocking. <laughs> but uh, but but today or tonight, we're going to be looking at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And and uh, man, I'll, I'll tell you, I believe this to be the most sobering and terrifying parables that that Jesus ever told. And, and obviously, as, as we read it and we start to kind of dissect it, um, I think you'll kind of have an understanding as to why I say that. Um, it, it's certainly a parable that we're going to see is filled with a lot of contrast. Um, it, it's also, I believe, a parable um, along with all the other parables. That's not just a story, um, but it's an actual event that took place. And, and I say that because there's no other parable in the Gospels that actually call one of the characters in the parable by name it's always a certain rich man a certain judge a certain person a certain this or that jesus actually gives us the name of one of the individuals that's in this that's in this parable obviously lazarus is his name and so um i believe like all the other parables this was an actual event actual thing that took place that jesus is using as an example to um, help us sort of understand the message that he's trying to get across in this particular parable. Um, I hope that by the end of this, that, that there's no doubt that you understand that once we die, we are carried to our eternal destination. I mean, within an instant, as we'll see in this parable. We'll see immediately what happened to Lazarus, We'll see immediately what happened to this rich man. And then, frighteningly, um, once we're there, there's no going back. There's no coming back here. There's no traveling between the two destinations. Um, and, and we'll also really see the reality of hell's torment. Um, and the comfort of paradise, though. Um, and, and I think... I, I think finally my, my hope is that, um, you know, we're going to understand that, uh, again, this is one of the most sobering parables, I think, in the scriptures. Um, sorrow and regret will, I think, lament the soul for all um, eternity as, as, as we're going to see um, with, with this with this certain rich man here that, that Jesus is talking about. And so with that being said, um, let me read to you out of Luke chapter 16, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Um, some people call him the beggar, the rich man and the beggar, but we have his name. And so we're going to call him by name. It says, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, 
which was laid at his gate full of sores and desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus received evil things? But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, Abraham would tell him, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let him let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And pray with me, church family. Heavenly Father, Lord God, as we begin to really just unpack this, uh, this parable, Lord, this parable that... Um, it's quite sobering, Lord, if you really start to dig into it and, and read it and understand it, Father God. I pray that our hearts and, Lord, our minds would be open to understand it, Father, the way that you have explained it in the scriptures, Lord God. I would pray that, Father, you would move anything aside that may be in our hearts or in our minds right now, Lord God, that maybe would just be a distraction to us, Father, whatever's maybe going on at home or at work or in our lives. Lord, let us just for this hour that lay ahead, Father, be able to focus on you, focus on your word, Lord God, and I just would ask that you would minister to us and, and speak to us and encourage us through it, Lord God. Bless this night, Father God, bless this study. I ask and pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. And so we, we get introduced to, uh, first, this, this, this rich man. It, that's the introduction to the parables that there was a certain rich man and and we get a little bit of a description about this rich man of course he was dressed um in purple and fine linen which which is interesting that he was dressed in, in in purple because purple was historically and traditionally a a color of royalty and so to be dressed in purple would often be an indicator, at least in Jesus' time, that, hey, maybe this guy is royalty. Maybe he's a king or, or maybe he's a prince. But I don't believe that he is or that he was. I believe that his money bought him the apparel. His money bought him the Gucci shoes and the Armani suit, right? But, but he, 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 didn't, he didn't have the, the position, so to speak, to go ahead and justify wearing that color uh, again purple was traditionally reserved for kings and, and and princes and rulers but this man was never addressed as such he was never addressed as a certain ruler or a certain prince or a certain king he was just a certain rich guy he was just a rich guy that's all, that's all he was um however he clearly thought of himself as royalty right so and that's what happens with, with a lot of rich people that have a lot of money. They think of themselves as royalty. And so what are you going to go do? You're going to go buy that apparel. You're going to buy those, those great colors. You're going to buy uh, the fancy cars and the clean looking shoes because, hey, I have the money and I want to I make myself look like somebody that's important, right? And so who's more important than a king or who's more important than royalty, right? right? So that's maybe why he was wearing that 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 apparel on top of that um here's a man who had his fill and then some every single day um it, it says and fared sumptuously meaning that he ate whatever he wanted all that he wanted the scripture says every day so every day this guy was feasting and and dining i mean you, you think of the the I, this may be an oxymoron, so forgive me, but think of the classiest buffet. 
uh, again, it might be an oxymoron. I've never been to a classic buffet, but maybe there is one that exists. But it's just filled with every every food and morsel that you could possibly imagine. I mean, T-bone steaks or filet mignons and ribeyes and crab and lobster and you know, you know, fruit biscuits and gravy and bacon. And I, I, I'd be set. The man was set every day. The scriptures say. By contrast, because remember, I mean, there's a lot of contrast in this in this parable. By contrast, however. We, we next get introduced to this, this second character named Lazarus. And Lazarus was a beggar. Lazarus had to be laid at the gate of this rich man, laid basically at the doorstep of, of this rich man. And furthermore, he was full of sores. This guy clearly had wounds all over his body possibly likened to the boils that we, we read about in the book of Job that Job had from head to toe. Um, but he's full of sores and, 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 he's, and he's a beg. He's, he has to beg for food every day. And, and, and the scriptures say that he desired, he begged just to, at the very least, to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. At the very least, that's what he was asking for. Hey, can I at least get the crumbs that are that are falling off the table? That 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 folks, if we're honest, what do we do? We sweep it up and throw it in the trash. Crumbs fall off the table, we sweep it up and we throw it in the trash. That's what this man was begging for. Was was what we today, with our first world problems, would, would sweep up and, and, and throw away in the trash. Um, unlike the rich man. Lazarus seemed to wear nothing more than sackcloth, maybe even rags, seen as how we hear that, that his skin was exposed to the point that the dogs were actually able to come over and lick his sores. So that would lead me to believe that, I mean, he was wearing, if he wasn't wearing sackcloth, maybe some rags, you know, he wasn't wearing long sleeves, he wasn't wearing maybe, you know, a, a long, uh, um, uh, clothing in that time that would, would cover his legs, go down to his ankles. He was probably dressed in rags and, and or sackcloth so that the dogs could come and literally lick the sores uh, of his wounds that he had on, on, on his body. And, and, and so that's, that's why I say that his skin was most likely exposed um, with the clothing that he had on. Um, again, more contrast, unlike the rich man who filled his belly daily with the finest foods and the finest drink and the finest, you know, delicatessens that, that one could obtain, Lazarus was left begging for the scraps from the rich man's table. Unlike the rich man's home, which was surrounded by walls and gates and no doubt decorated and adorned by you know, the finest furniture, furnishings and, and, and the finest linens and, and the, the, the gold plated, this, that, or the other, and the silver, this, that, or the other, that, that you would traditionally find in a rich person's home. Lazarus was left outside the gate surrounding this rich man's home to beg on the street. Unlike the rich man who, who had everything brought to him whenever he asked, because usually with wealth, you have servants, you have people that are, what can I get you? What do you want? You know, do you need anything? And this rich man, no doubtedly had those people that, hey, I want this. And they would bring it to him. Hey, go do this. And they would do that for him. Lazarus had to be laid at the gate, laid at the gate, unable to move because of the sores to beg someone for breadcrumbs. What does this tell us? A couple of things. Lazarus had to be laid at the gate. He couldn't even walk, which is why I possibly suggested boils because they could certainly have been on his feet, on the bottom of his feet, and that would, that would make it impossible to walk. You remember the story of Job. Job had to break a pot, get a pot shirt, and, and literally scrape the sores, get all that, that, that funk and that nastiness right out of the sores. Unlike the rich man who, like most in his day, detested dogs, 
Lazarus' only companion while he was begging at that gate seemed to be the very dogs that the rest of the town detested. And it says it, it came to pass that the, that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And what this parable is starting to show us is that there's two men with two different lives that have two different deaths and two different destinies. The beggar dies, Lazarus dies, and he's, and he's carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Folks, Jesus is telling us in this parable that when we die, we are ushered by the angels into the presence of the Lord. The angels carried him in death, carried him to a place of comfort, to a place of rest, and to a place of refuge. Now, many have debated, and this was a quite an, an exhausting study for me personally, what Abraham's bosom was. Was it literal? Was it figurative? It, is it symbolic? What is, what was Abraham's bosom? Um, some would say that, that, that it actually was a transitional waiting room of sorts before inheriting the kingdom of God. And, and I'm going to expand on, on a few things that that hopefully will help you understand a little bit more. But, but first, I want to share John 3.13 with you. And it's important to understand this verse based on the direction I'm about to take you. John 3.13, Jesus says this, And no man, no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. What is Jesus saying here? No man has been up to heaven but me. No man has been up there but me. And so by this point in Jesus' earthly ministry, it begs the question, well, then where have all the Old Testament saints gone? If, if no man has been up to heaven, because that's what Jesus said in John 3.13, where did all the Old Testament saints go? I'm, I'm hoping to share with you right now where, where, where they went. First of all, we need to understand that it's impossible for anyone to inherit the kingdom before the king. It's impossible. The king has to inherit the kingdom first before he opens the kingdom up to others. Okay? No one comes before the king in inheriting the kingdom of God. And, and yes, we are called heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God, but Jesus had to be given the kingdom first before anybody else. Also, before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, everybody who died, everybody who died, bear with me, went to what we would read in the Old Testament, a place called Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, or some refer to it even as Hades. But, but please keep in mind right now, this is not the eternal punishment of hell that you would first think of it as, okay? But a place at the time for the Old Testament and before Jesus ascended up to heaven after his death, this was a place that was divided in at least two compartments. Sheol was divided. That's why we will read again in a moment that there was a great gulf between the two, okay? But Sheol was a place that was divided. One was a place of torment where we, where, where we see this rich man because the scripture says he was tormented. While the other was a place of blessing, a place of comfort, and a place of rest where we see Lazarus being in the bosom of Abraham, okay? We know that Jesus Christ based on the scriptures, went into the lower parts of the earth. 
For, for reference, I would ask you, if you want to, read Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Ephesians 4, 8, 9, and 10. Paul talks about the fact that Jesus went into the lower parts of the earth. That would be Sheol in the Old Testament. It says that he went into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, right? While his body was in the grave. We get that from Matthew 12 and 40. The Lord Jesus told the repentant thief on the cross. Who, who can tell me what he told the thief on the cross that repented? What's that, Jake? You will sit in heaven next to me. Today you will be with me in paradise. Absolutely. That, that's exactly what he said. This would tell us. If Jesus told the repentant thief that today, that day, he would be with him in paradise, but yet the scriptures say that Jesus went into the lower parts of the earth after he died, would that be a contradiction of the scriptures that paradise and, and, and heaven weren't where, where they, they were? No, it's not. What that's telling us is that paradise at that time was in Sheol, again, divided and separated from the place of torment where we see Lazarus, excuse me, where we see the rich man, to the place of rest where we see Lazarus. This would tell us again that, that paradise, the same place that Jesus told the rich man that he will, or the, the thief on the cross, that he will be with him there today, However, at, as after, after Jesus rose from the dead, we, we know that, that on that 40th day, he ascended up into heaven. The scriptures tell us, tell us in the book of Acts that, that he ascended up to heaven. He ascended to the Father and, and was sat down at the right hand of God. And what did he do? He took those saints with him that were in Sheol. He took them with him. He's down there in the, in, in, in the lower parts of the earth. He's ministering to the saints that were there with Abraham, that were resting with Abraham, waiting for the day of the Messiah. And when he ascended up to heaven, he took them with him, forever separating the saints from those that are going to experience everlasting torment in, in, in hell. In Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, Paul would tell us that Jesus led captivity captive. And so those that were, that were captive, so to speak, they weren't prisoners, but those that were being held in Sheol with Abraham awaiting the, the Messiah, Jesus led them, he led captivity captive up into heaven with him when he ascended to his throne when he ascended to the right hand of the Father. That, that paradise, if you will, what was then moved to heaven. And that is confirmed, by the way, by the Apostle Paul, who, if you recall in 2 Corinthians 12, speaks of a man that had a vision that he was caught up into paradise. You remember the story, Paul was, he had a vision, I know a man. And, I, and he was caught up into paradise, and he heard unspeakable things when he was there. That would confirm that, 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 that Jesus, when he ascended, heaven opened where Jesus is, and, and he brought those saints that, that were waiting for him in Sheol with Abraham. He brought those saints with him. We also know that Paul said this. Paul said that to be absent from the body is to be what? Present, Present with the Lord. So if, if, if we're absent from the body, and Paul says that if we are, that, we're, that we are present with the Lord, if the Lord is in heaven, then why would anybody else continue to go to Sheol where Abraham is? They wouldn't. And so <laughs> there was a lot of diving into the scriptures to kind of unpack this so that hopefully we can understand it. We also see basically in, in Revelation chapter 7 verse 9, 
John describes a scene that he sees in heaven where a great multitude that no man could number of every tribe and every tongue and every nation was. And by the way, Revelation chapter 7 was way before Revelation chapter 19 when Jesus came back down to conquer earth. And so 12 chapters before that, John is seeing that, that there's a great multitude of people in heaven already with Jesus. With, with, with Christ's work complete, the finished work of the cross, that is, the death, burial, and resurrection, the believers who had been in Abraham's bosom, that had been with Abraham and had been comforted by him and by the Old Testament saints that, that were waiting for that promise, that were waiting for that hope of the Messiah, they were now taken to heaven to wait, to wait in God's presence until the time of their, our resurrection, their resurrection, to enter into the kingdom of, of, of heaven here on earth. Because remember, on that day, we're going to get new bodies. We're going to get the new heaven, the new earth, the new bodies. Man, we're all going to be looking the best we've ever looked in our entire lives. Praise the Lord for that, right? And so I, I hope that helps clarify if it confuses Let's, you know, let's, um, let, let's talk about that at the end, but hopefully that clarifies, I think, some, some doctrinal questions that, that a lot of people have about Abraham's bosom. Where was it? What is it? Does it exist today? Um, and, and I hope I was able to maybe answer a couple of those questions. If not, let's have that discussion here um, before we leave tonight. But, but again, this is where we see the position of Lazarus to be, in Abraham's bosom, He's there being comforted by Abraham. David is no doubt there. Adam and Eve are there. Uh, Abel is there. I mean, all the, all the Old Testament saints that we know, right? And while, while all it says about the rich man, though, again, in contrast, was that he was buried. That's all it says. He was buried, which we'll soon see was a, was a reference of him going to hell. And so Jesus continues and says, and in hell, this rich man, he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and sees Abraham afar off. And Lazarus is, is, is there with Abraham, resting with Abraham. And, he, and this rich man, he cries and, and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So as, as, as mentioned earlier, again, there, there were two separate areas in the lower part of the earth, if you will, in Sheol, um, that again, Jesus would descend into, because it's in the scriptures, for those three days and three nights while he was in the tomb. And, and, and what we see the rich man doing here is lifting up his eyes because it says and he lift up his eyes being in torment and and he sees abraham and lazarus afar off which would mean to tell me that that not only were, were there two separate places if if you will in sheol but that the place of comfort where abraham was was a place that seemed to be elevated above they, they were above because the rich man had to had to lift up his eyes. He had, to, he had to look up. He had to see Abraham and Lazarus afar off. And we'll also see in a moment in, in a verse coming up that there was clearly a big divide. There, there was a big divide between where the rich man was and where Lazarus and Abraham were. And, and, and I found it also interesting that he addressed Abraham as father Abraham, right? Father Abraham. This rich man, and this is what happens so often, who in a position of desperation, because that's what it was, he was in a position of desperation, is now acknowledging the promise of God that Abraham was to be a father of many. Now all of a sudden, when you don't really practice religion, it's when you are in desperation that you want to all of a sudden find religion, right? And, and listen, praise the Lord for, for, for his mercy, 
because while we have time, while we have breath in our lungs and while we have time on this earth, we often find ourselves in moments of desperation, moments of despair. Um, maybe we're, we're living a lifestyle. Maybe we're doing things. Uh, maybe you've gone to prison. Maybe you've just done stuff where, you know, all of a sudden you're in this, you're in this position of desperation and, and you cry out to God. Praise God that right now, as long as you have breath in your lungs, God will hear you. And God can rescue and God can spare and God can save and God can restore. But unfortunately for the rich man, that ship done sail. It's gone. But all of a sudden he finds religion, right? He calls out Father Abraham and maybe even for the first time in his life, he went back to the Torah. He, he goes back to the Mosaic books, the, the first five books of, of the Bible. And, and, and he, he all of a sudden, he, now he remembers the covenant of God with Moses and with his people. But again, sadly, it was already too late. We also learn that this rich man, in, in contrast to his earthly life, was now tormented by fire and by thirst. This rich man had all the comforts in the world when he was alive on earth. He probably thirsted for nothing. And all of a sudden we find him tormented and thirsty. And we know from Revelation that this torment is an everlasting torment. It, it never goes away. It never stops. It never ceases. It never takes a break. It never takes a time off. It's everlasting, eternal torment. That this rich man went from, from having no empathy, no compassion, no regard for, for maybe anybody, let alone Lazarus while on earth, to crying and begging Abraham for just a drop of water on the tongue. How many of you have been so thirsty you would have almost killed for a drop of water on the top? I've been there. I remember being up at 29 Palms in the Marine Corps and it being uncomfortable. I'll just say that up there as a Marine in the middle of the desert in 29 Palms. And we're doing field ops and we're doing exercises out there. In I think it was in September. And, uh, you know, you, you carry with you, you got a five gallon, you know, water can that you bring with you to kind of refill and, and make sure you're good to go. But if you're out there for a week, if you're out there for two weeks and, and it's just you and, and, and your, you know, your, your buddy, your teammate that you're there with and you run out of water, you, you're kind of up a creek. And, and, and I've been in a position where I've been so thirsty, my mouth is dry. I, I swear that the dust and sand of this valley is clung to the to the roof of my mouth and and to my tongue and, and there seems to be no reprieve of, of 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 moisture that would just feel so good but that's the position now that this rich man finds himself in but abraham's response to him is this son remember that thou in thy lifetime received good things and likewise lazarus evil things he says but now but now Lazarus is comforted and you are tormented. Their roles seemingly swapped in eternity. On earth, it, it, it was the exact opposite. On earth, the rich man was, was, was comfortable. On, the, on earth, the rich man was blessed. On, the rich man, on earth, the rich man had no worries. While Lazarus begged and pleaded and, and was hungry and thirsty and starving and had, had really no friends. And when they both died, those roles, they reversed. It was the exact opposite. Abraham reminds the rich man that he had it all on earth while Lazarus had nothing. But now Lazarus has everything. And all the rich man has is torment. And I believe this to be true. I believe that the rich man knew who Lazarus was on earth. He had to have known Lazarus. He had to have known Lazarus because Lazarus was daily parked at the rich man's gate. And so as the rich man is, is coming and going in, in his day-to-day -day business, 
He had to have interaction with Lazarus. He had to know who he was, that he was a beggar, that he was poor, that he was sick and, and was covered with sores. I'm convinced he had to know that Lazarus, who Lazarus was. And it's almost as if Abraham is telling this rich man that, dude, you, you had opportunity to be compassionate. You had opportunity to do good things with the riches and with the wealth and with the blessings that you had to help Lazarus, who was dealing with his evil things, with his swords and with his pains and with his hunger. But now for the rich man, that opportunity no longer existed. He didn't have an opportunity to do well, to do what's right, to help. And Abraham goes on to tell him, and you know, beside all of this, between you and us, there's a great gulf, a great gulf fixed, so that they would not, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. You know, I mentioned a moment ago this, this big divide between where Abraham was and, and where the rich man was, and Jesus describes it as, as a, a great gulf fixed. Uh, imagine, you know, I imagine, you know, there's a, there's a great gulf between the uh, south rim and the north rim of the Grand Canyon. That's a great gulf between two places, right? Um, and 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 when when something is described as being fixed, it doesn't mean that it was broken once and then somebody fixed it and it's good to go. Fixed means that it's 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 immovable. It's fixed. It's it's set in stone. And, and unless God himself would move it, there's not a chance of it being shaken. And so this great gulf between Abraham and Lazarus and between this rich man was there and, and, it, and it wasn't going away. It, it, it was immovable, if, if you will, and, and there was nothing that, that, that could be done about it. This verse also confirms to us, ladies and gentlemen, the finality of hell. The finality of hell and of eternity. This, this, this chasm, if you will, between heaven and hell can never be crossed. Abraham made it very clear. If you're there, rich man, you can't come here. And us up here, we can never go there. There's a finality to eternity. The sentence, if you will, it's, it's a forever sentence. It's literally eternity without the possibility of parole. That, that's what it is. And, and while Jesus describes to us that the, the two could see each other, because again, they're having dialogue. That there's, there's a conversation between the, between the two places. It was impossible to pass from, from one place to the other. Um, I, I could only imagine ladies and gentlemen, the pain and the torment it must have been to see, for this rich man to see all the Old Testament saints, to see them up there being comforted, to see them up there having rest, to see them up there being blessed, really is what they were, what they were being. They were being blessed up there. How unbelievably painful it must have been knowing that just out of reach is a place you will never be able to go and see and experience. You'll never be at peace. You'll never be resting. The flames of Hades, of hell, will torment. Again, we, we went over this in Revelation, but they will torment the body day and night with no comfort, no peace, and no rest. So then we see in verses 27 and 28 that this, this rich man kind of changes his tune. I, I think the reality or the realization of eternity is now set in, and, and, and he changes the course of the conversation. And, and then he says in verse 27, I pray thee, therefore, Father, talking to Abraham, that thou would send him Lazarus. He wanted to send Lazarus. Have Abraham send Lazarus to his father's house, for he has five brothers there, so that Lazarus can go and testify to them, so that Lazarus can go and, and preach the gospel to them, really is what needed to happen. Lest 
they also come into this place of torment. Again, I think this, this rich man realized the finality of the position that he was in. And for the rest of, and, 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 excuse me, for the first time in his life, maybe he became burdened for lost souls. If at the very least he was now burdened for his brothers. He pleads with Abraham. He says, I pray thee, I, I, I plead with you, I, I beg you, Abraham, send Lazarus to dad's house. Send him to my dad's house to convince my five brothers that hell is real, that this place of torment, this place of shield is real. And that they can repent and believe on the promise of the Messiah. What we see here is generational rebellion. Generational rebellion against the Lord. You have the rich man. You have his five brothers still living at home with dad. Who at this point in Jesus' earthly ministry, by the way, were bound for hell because of their unbelief. Lazarus knew that his five brothers weren't saved. Lazarus knew that his five brothers believed and lived the same way that he did. Without a care, without a regard without a respect for persons at all in his life. That's how the rich man lived. No doubt that's how his brothers lived because he pleads with Abraham to go save my brothers. I don't want them to experience what I'm experiencing. And up to that point, his brothers weren't saved. Who knows if at some point down the road they, they, they got saved. Maybe they heard the preaching of Jesus later on in, the earthly, in his earthly ministry. Maybe they heard the preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost. Maybe they heard James or John. Maybe they heard Timothy, who, Paul or Timothy, who knows? We don't know that. But now knowing the torment and reality of hell, this man does not want his brothers to come to the place where he is. Church family, I'm convinced that every single person since Adam and Eve, the first two on earth, that has rebelled against the Lord. And dare I say, maybe Cain was the first one that ethics biblically that we, we know rebelled against the Lord. I believe every person that finds themselves today being tormented on the in the flames of hell wishes that they could send someone, somehow, some way, to get a message to their loved ones to tell them that it's real. It's real. If you don't know the name Alistair Crowley, Alistair Crowley is the founder of the Church of Satan. He was a devout um, non-believer of God, but heavy believer in Satan. I, I don't know how you get that too, because if you believe in one, I think you have to believe in the other. But he worshipped Satan all of his life, and it was on Alistair Crowley's deathbed in his final moments, that it was reported by everybody around that he began to yell and began to shout, no, no, I've made a big mistake. Because as death was setting in on Aleister Crowley on his deathbed, I believe that in the same manner that the angels ushered Lazarus into the presence of Abraham, that demons grabbed Aleister Crowley and brought him down to the depths of hell. I believe that to be 100% true. It, I, I hate to compare Hollywood to this, but if you've ever seen the movie Ghost with uh, Patrick Swayze and, and, and Whoopi Goldberg, there, there's a few scenes in Ghost where those evil people that die in the movie, that's exactly what happened. You see these dark figures coming out of the shadows to pull down into hell these people that were evil in the movie. I believe that is exactly what happened to Aleister Crowley. He saw these dark figures. He saw these demons. They were there to bring him down into hell. And he shouts, no, no, I've made a big mistake. I would implore you today. I would implore anybody listening, anybody that's going to hear this, 
to not wait another minute to tell those who do not know the Lord in your life that eternity is too long to be wrong. It, 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 it really is up to us. It's, it's up to you and I to be the voice in the wilderness to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ while we still have time. And, and, and listen, I don't think that you can beat the gospel horse enough. Now, I, I do understand the principle of don't give that which is holy to the dogs. Don't cast your pearls to the swine. There are some like your Aleister Crowley's, there may be even some in your own life that will absolutely just snarl and spit and get angry and hate you if you even mention the name of Jesus in their presence. Sometimes you just got to, uh, it's not worth my time and effort. But as much as we can, we have to proclaim the gospel. We have to share Jesus with people. In verse 29, we see that Abraham again said to him, well, hey, you know, you want, you, you want me to send Lazarus to your brothers, but, but dude, they have Moses and the prophets. They, 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 they have from Genesis to Micah. They, they have everything that they need to be saved. Let them, let the brothers hear, them, hear Moses and the prophet. Let them read the scriptures for themselves and understand. Abraham tells him, listen again, you, you have the law, you, you have the scriptures, you have the prophecies. They essentially had all the Old Testament. They had the Bible. They had everything that they needed to believe just like the rich man had. They had everything they needed to believe in the promise of God, of the coming Messiah, just like the rich man had. His brothers had access to it. But there's a little bit of an argument ensuing. In verse 30, he says, he says, Nay, or no, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Many Jews in Jesus' day and leading up to Jesus' day, and, and many since then, of course, they wanted a sign. Jesus even calls out those in the Gospels that wanted a sign, right? They wanted a sign when it came to prophecy. Give us a sign that you say who you are, you say. Well, I, didn't, I don't need to give you a sign. Read the Bible. You'll know exactly who I am. Know your father. You'll know exactly who I am if you actually knew your father. And it's as if this rich man was suggesting to Abraham that, that the word of God was insufficient to save his brothers. I mean, after all, Abraham responds and says, listen, you've got the word of God. And, and, and the guy says, well, well, no, that's not good enough. But if you send somebody that, that's been dead to go talk to them, then maybe they'll believe. To that, I would say, how'd that work out for Jesus? Not so good. I mean, surely you must believe somebody that you know to be dead, you must believe that if he came back to life, he's telling the truth. How many times were prophets in the Old Testament sent by the Lord to warn Israel? How many times did Moses warn Israel? Did they listen? No. We probably wouldn't have listened, let's be honest. Did they turn back and repent? No. Maybe a few did, but most of them did not. Lazarus showing up on the doorstep of the rich man father, rich man's father's house, it would be no different. It wouldn't have changed anything. And so Abraham's reply in, in this last verse here in verse 31, and he said unto him, if they hear not Moses, and the prophets, neither will be, they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Jesus would close this parable by telling those who were listening, and I believe by telling you and I today, that if they didn't listen to Moses, if they didn't listen to the prophets, if they didn't want to hear what the scriptures themselves said, even though he himself, 
Jesus would soon be raised from the dead, they still wouldn't listen. They still wouldn't listen. Unbelief is not an intellectual problem. There is more than sufficient testimony to God and his goodness in creation and in scripture so that everyone is without excuse. Paul addresses that in Romans chapter 1. There's sufficient evidence of the scriptures and of God so that no one will be without excuse. Unbelief is not an intellectual problem. I believe unbelief to be a moral problem. It boils down to being a moral problem. Unbelievers, they don't worship because they don't want to. Unbelievers don't listen because they, they don't want to listen. Unbelievers, they don't, they, they, they don't have ears to hear because they don't want to hear. Anyone, I believe, that denies God's existence does not do it out of ignorance, but they do it out of choice. We have everything we need in the Bible to not end up like the rich man did. We have everything we need. And so with that being said, that, that closes out the parable of the rich man and, and Lazarus. I, I know I, I didn't have, I, I've tried for the last few weeks to kind of seed in some questions. I, I just, in, in teaching this, I, I just couldn't find a, a place to maybe plant a question to pose to you guys but, but what I did want to do is I did want to, I did want to ask if there are any questions about this, if there are any go-backs, if there's any, anything that I can clarify with you. Uh, again, this is one of the, the heaviest parables that I think Jesus tells in the scriptures, and, and there's a lot to unpack here. And so um, I, I hope that, that, that I did it to the point to where it, 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 you understand and, and, and maybe you, you get it, but if there's anything I can answer for you, anything I can clarify for you, well, let's have that discussion right now. Yes, mom. Well, son, you brought up the whole thing about choice and when the rich man was in Hades or uh, where he was sent after burial, he, he knew the Lord, like you said. He recognized and call him Father Abraham. Right. So it wasn't a strange. It wasn't a stranger to him. Right. Right. Whether all of a sudden he knew in his heart, oh, this must be Abraham. Um, but it was interesting. I, well, uh, again, the, the rich man was without excuse because God had. I mean, God had reveals blessed. Himself to all to His creation. We know from, from, from Romans, God reveals himself to his creation, right? And, and so, uh, again, it, it's not because of ignorance. Oh, I, I didn't know. It, it's, it's choice, right? And I think it's been choice since the beginning. He gave Adam and Eve choice. Hey, you can have whatever you want. Just this one thing, right? Right, 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 right. 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 But, but then he wouldn't be the loving God that he was, right, I think. So, he, he wouldn't be a dictator, yeah. He wouldn't learn. No. No. That's not really interesting. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. I, this is the first time I've noticed it in reading this. In, uh, when he first cries out and he cries, it says Father Abraham. Yes. Father's capitalized. Father is capitalized. And then oh, in verse 30, when he says, Nay, Father Abraham, it's, 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 it's lowercase. That when he's rebelling and he Right. Like, wait, wait, hold on. Right. Am I getting what I want? Like, and so, like for me, when I see, I have like a visual of him like bowing down and, and being humble. Father Abraham, oh my gosh, please, please, please. And then right. When he realizes it's not working, you're not getting away. Yeah. It, yeah. Wait a second. Hang on. Like, why not? Yeah. It, it was almost as if that first recognition was sort of a. A, 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 an esteemed title. Yeah. Like, wow, I, I recognize you as father. You're the father of, of many. You're father Abraham, right? 
Um, and then all of a sudden, I'm not getting my way. It, it just runs a great parallel to the um, how many will say to me, Father, Father, um, on that day, and then I will look at them and say, I never knew you. Dion, I'm getting into that this Sunday, and I'm not looking forward to it. Yeah. That, that's one of the hardest, that's one of the toughest things in Scripture to read. Yeah. Any other questions, comments, go backs? <laughs> yeah, kind of. I mean, this was, I mean, it's a, this is a heavy parable. It, it really is a heavy parable. But uh, again, the, 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 the things that, that we, the, the, the believer, the comfort that we get in this is not only the, you know, the ushering up of the angels into the presence of the Lord, but, but we know that when we get there, I mean, it's confirmed. It's just this place of comfort and this place of rest and this place of blessing. And so um, I, I know it's where I know it's where all of us are going to be. Um, and I know it's where we want everybody we know to be. Um, we just, you know, uh, we just need to be diligent about um, trying to get people there. And uh, doing what we can. Um, I, I was reading. Uh, I'll take a couple minutes. I, I was reading a. Uh, I was reading the Second Chronicles chapter thirty, um, a story about Hezekiah and Hezekiah. Kind of, he becomes king. He reestablishes order in the temple, and and uh, they they uh, the, the priests and the Levites they sanctify themselves. They do the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and then then Hezekiah, you know, he he has it in his heart to to reunite Israel. With Judah, because at this point, remember, in the kingdom of Israel, it was divided. You have you had Israel, and you had Judah, and they were two separate kingdoms, right? But Israel, uh, Hezekiah, had it in his heart to to um, to to reunite that relationship, and so he sends out this letter and tells you know tells his brethren, the Israelites all around Israel, saying, "Hey, listen, it's time to turn back to the Lord. It's time to let's keep the Lord's path." Passover. Why, why don't you guys come up to Jerusalem? Come up to the temple. Let's do Passover together, like we used to, and like it should be done. And and um, as that letter was going out all all abroad, all throughout Israel, um, they, most people laughed at and mocked and scorned what Hezekiah was trying to do. Um, but the encouraging part of that is that a few did show up, and so that becomes this. This, um, I think, necessity that even if you know most are going to mock it, most are going to laugh at it, most are going to belittle it, most are going to ignore it, we've got to send the letter anyways for those few that are actually going to want to hear what you have to say. It, it makes it worth it. Um, and so... Uh, so with that being said, let me let me close this out in a word of prayer, and then uh, and then we'll call it an evening. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you so much for um, for this word, Lord, for the parable of, of the rich man and, and Lazarus, and as sobering uh, and as realistic as it is, Lord God, uh, as 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 Father, as real as, as you made it uh, in your scriptures, Father God. I would just ask and pray that, uh, Lord, you would give us time over this next day, maybe a couple of days to just meditate on this, Father God. Maybe we go back and, and read it again. Maybe we look at Ephesians 4, 8, 9, and 10 that talk about Jesus going down to the inner part of the earth, Lord God. Whatever it is that you would draw us to, to just continue to understand the scripture, to continue to meditate on it, Father. I would ask that you would do that in our lives, Lord God. I, I pray, Father, that each person here, Lord God, would be impacted by this Father, that they would grow in your word and, and just have a deeper understanding and knowledge of your word. And that, Father God, you would, you would use me, Father God, to just be your voice, to be your hands and your feet, to be your eyes and ears, Lord God. But more importantly for me and my desire, Lord, to be your heart. Father, I just want to pour my heart out over this church and over this church family. And Father, I just love them so much and, and I thank you for them. And just pray that you would bless them as they go out tonight, Lord God, and head back home. And Father, already looking forward to Sunday, Father God. I pray for your blessings. It's in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.